Well, there have been many recent developments. Certainly, we're seeing different strategies by different countries as they move forward, either unlocking or beginning to do what some countries have called circuit breakers, put in lockdowns in certain sectors. So we're seeing that countries are how to deal with this infection, but there are still things that we don't know. One of those is about the antibody that's produced from infection. The antibody is what's produced by the blood there is an infection, and we don't know whether in this case it's protective, it protects against reinfection or not. We know that antibodies in other viruses do protect against reinfection. We also know that antibodies against other coronaviruses that are present in humans don't protect fully, and that after a year you can be reinfected with the same virus. So we're trying better to understand that part of the immune response to the virus, and we're also trying to understand what will happen in the longer term once the lockdown that's occurred in many European countries begins to be loosened as it has been in Gibraltar. Recent research has suggested that no one has contracted the virus from a child. That is, that is to say, no child has actually passed it on. What, what do you make of this? Well, the problem is that there's really no evidence as to whether or not uh, children are getting numbers as adults, and if they are getting infected, whether they can transmit that virus. Those are questions that still are not understood. What has occurred, though, in Singapore is that they've begun to see that people in households appear to possibly have been infected by children who were in school and who had no symptoms or signs of infection. So this is all work that's being done. And what will be very important as schools open up is, as is being done in Gibraltar and other places, physical distancing is respected in schools. And at the same time, students may be going in smaller numbers in shifts rather than all at the same time, avoiding assemblies, avoiding places where students usually gather. And last week, I believe that a Korean lab discovered that no person who has been infected and recovered from the infection has relapsed. So uh, what would you say to this? Yes, what was found in Korea was that a certain number of people who had recovered and who had become PCR negative, that means who no longer had evidence that the virus was in their nasal pad, became in a couple of weeks PCR positive again. And the studies that have been done since then have shown that this probably was not reinfection, but was just a simple fact that this was pieces of the virus which remained in the nasal passages that were not infectious, yet were still there and were gradually being eliminated by the, the humans. So there is no evidence that there is reinfection with this virus in people who have recovered at present. But that's still study going on. Now, you've advised the Gibraltar government on its management of the crisis. What would you say are the main challenges and advantages for a population like Gibraltar when attempting to tackle the spread of the virus, considering its size, its population density, and the fact that we share a border with Spain? Yes, well, two of the big challenges have been, number one, the border that's being shared with Spain, and number two, has been how to protect the elderly. And in both of those instances, Gibraltar has been very innovative. In the elderly, I know that there have been special times when the elderly could go and do their shopping for groceries, for example. And now there are these golden hours when the elderly can go out into parks at certain times of the day and know that they won't uh, be exposed to other people in close proximity. So there's been a lot of innovation in trying to protect the elderly, and that appears to have been very successful. At the same time, there has been attempts to make sure that the virus has not come in with workers coming in to work in the various sectors in Gibraltar, and that's been border controls and, and making sure that infected people do not come in. And there have been a couple instances, I believe, where there have been infected people who have been working in various um, various professions within Gibraltar or various jobs that, that have been infected 
and the contacts of those people have been successfully traced and those people have been successfully isolated. So Walter's been working very hard and the fruits of that have been that there has been a very low level of transmission recently and it continues to be low. The Gibraltar government has revealed that its new strategy to deal with the virus is aggressive contact tracing, including the use of smartphone technology. How successful has this methodology been in other countries? Well, it's not yet been tried in many other countries. It's been successful in Germany, where it's been used right along. And Germany has kept the level of transmission of this virus very low by continuing to isolate people who are infected, either if they're patients or if they're contacts, tracing the contacts, identifying those who are sick, making sure that if they are sick with COVID, they're isolated. They've been successful in Europe in doing that. And Asian countries that had previous outbreaks of SARS or MERS coronavirus, including Hong Kong, Singapore, Taiwan, and South Korea, have been very successful with this I, this method that's now being adopted and used in Gibraltar, which is contact tracing and outbreak control. And so I think Gibraltar will have a very, probably very good success in doing this, as has been shown in other countries where that strategy has been prioritized. There is a suggestion that this virus could become endemic and something we have to live with, like the seasonal flu. How likely is this and how can health authorities and governments learn to deal with this? Well, I wish I could say what will happen, what will be the final destiny of this virus, but we don't know yet. Many of the modelers think they know, and the modelers have said that this will continue to reoccur um, throughout the next few years. But that's, that's a guess based on best possible evidence at present. But the one thing that nobody knows is the destiny of this virus. This virus could remain with us for long term, like HIV has done. HIV emerged from the animal kingdom, is now endemic in humans. It could be like certain pandemic influenza viruses, which cause a pandemic and this disappears. Or it could just stay at a low level in populations and cause difficult. We just don't know what this virus will do. We hope for the best and we have to plan for the worst. Well, the world is lying in hope for the development of an antiviral or a vaccine. How far away would you say we are from this? Well, there's been a lot of talk about vaccine and there are over 100 different studies going on for development of new vaccines in China, in Europe, in India and the rest of the world. And those trials are all at various stages using various techniques. Some are using the normal techniques of killing a virus and then making that as into a vaccine. Others are using live attenuated viruses, which are viruses which have been incapacitated to cause disease, but still cause infection and cause immune responses. And others are using virus-like particles, particles that resemble what's called the spike protein um, that would be the, the area where you want to create immunity. And still others are using whole RNA um, uh, sequences to try to do vaccination. These are some of these are new techniques. And, you know, we can hope that they will be successful. But vaccine development has usually in the past been a very long process. In fact, we still don't have being vaccines for many diseases such as HIV. And uh, we just have a new malaria vaccine. But these are vaccines that have been studied for many, many years. So we can hope for the best that there will be a vaccine available in a short time and that that vaccine can be equitably distributed throughout the world. There's no guarantee that the vaccines currently being developed will be effective because we just don't know enough about the immune system and about these new vaccines. And finally, Professor, if I could ask you for, for your background as uh, an infection control specialist and uh, what is the nature of your work with the World Health Organization? Well, my career was a career with the Centers for Disease Control out of Atlanta in the U.S. But I began my career in 1976 when I went with the CDC team to the first outbreak of Ebola in the DRC, then known as Zaire. I stayed in Africa for 13 years working with Ebola and various other hemorrhagic fevers, and also with other diseases such as malaria. And then I was seconded from the Centers for Disease Control 
to the World Health Organization, where I remained for 22 years in various um, capacities. Um, in fact, at the time of the SARS outbreak, I was in charge of the cluster on communicable diseases and led that response from WHO. Since then, I've been in the United Kingdom. I've been a professor at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, and I was actually the chairman of Public Health England for eight years when I first arrived in the UK. Now I'm just working at the London School and a think tank called Chatham House. So I've had a career that's and in global politics. And today, in addition to the jobs in the UK, I'm the chairman of the advisory committee to the World Health Organization's emergency program, which is the program from which the outbreak is being managed at present. 